A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In these politically divisive times, some of us long for a return to the clarity of the Bible. You know, like back when people knew right from wrong and religious people didn't argue over politics. Well, right, like our text today, you mean? Two parties of Jews approach Jesus to ask him about paying taxes to the Roman government. It wasn't even an honest question. It was more like, I don't know, bringing him before a Senate committee composed of opposing parties who would rather make points at his expense than actually learn what he really thinks. Hmm. In this case, both parties are trying to entrap Jesus so they can keep faith with their constituencies. We'll see more about this in a minute. But first I need to say, what this passage is not about. When some of you heard the text read about whether taxes should be paid, I know what you were thinking. I see what you're doing there, George. Using the Bible to go after President Trump about his taxes. Actually, no. Our gospel text today just happens to have been the assigned reading for this Sunday. And while I wish that our tax system weren't designed so that wealthy people could figure out how to avoid paying their fair share, tax avoidance is not the same thing as tax evasion. We'll let the courts sort that out with respect to the president. This passage is not about that. It's also not about the separation of church and state. When Jesus says to render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God's, this is not the root of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Baptist, treasure, church, state, separation. At least we used to. Even the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas was a staunch defender of it. Not the current pastor, don't you know? I mean George W. Truett, who a hundred years ago stood on the east steps of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. at the invitation of some Baptists in that area and held forth on what Baptists believe. He called this statement of Jesus, one of the most revolutionary and history-making utterances that ever fell from those lips divine. That utterance, once and for all, marked the divorcement of church and state. It marked a new era for the creeds and deeds of men. It was the sunrise gun of a new day, the echoes of which are to go on and on and on until in every land, whether great or small, the doctrine shall have absolute supremacy everywhere of a free church in a free state. Beautifully said, and again, 
I'm all for a free church and a free state. But that's not what Jesus is up to here. He wasn't setting forth a new theory of human government. He was answering a trick question in a brilliant way that stumped his opponents and instructs us even now on our loyalties to God and governments. So back to the story itself. You know the phrase, politics makes for strange bedfellows? Or how about this one? My enemy's enemy is my friend. Well, exhibit A right here. So the Pharisees were a religious group that held scrupulously to the law of Moses. And so when it came to paying taxes to a pagan empire whose emperor claimed divine status, they felt like sinners trading in a coin with a graven image of a man on it, a coin that read, Tiberius Caesar, majestic son of the divine Augustus. Not exactly in God we trust, huh? The Herodians were more practical. They believed that by going along with Rome, they could carve out enough negotiated space to live peaceably and devoutly without compromising their faith. Much, anyway. These two groups could hardly agree on anything except the need to get rid of Jesus. So they conspire and ask him whether it is lawful for a Jew to pay taxes to Rome. Now, if Jesus answers the way the Pharisees think, the answer is no. And then the Herodians can tell the Romans that Jesus is provoking sedition and he will be arrested. If he answers the way the Herodians think, it's a yes. And then the Pharisees can call him a blasphemer and the people will turn on him as a Roman collaborator. Jesus is in a lose-lose situation. Or so they think. Jesus asks for a coin. Whose image is on this coin, he asks. Caesar's, they say. And Jesus says, now watch my wording. Then give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The Greek word used here is not give, but rather give back, as in repay. And this is easily missed even today when we think about paying our taxes. We grumble about having to give up something that belongs to us, that is rightfully ours, that someone is demanding to us, of us, by co coercion. We may resent that and try to undermine our obligations by talking about all, where all that money goes and by electing people who will promise to cut our taxes. The late senator from South Carolina, Fritz Hollings, told the story of a veteran returning from Korea who went to college on the GI Bill bought his house with an FHA loan, saw his kids born in a VA hospital, started a business with an SBA loan, got electricity from the TVA, and then water from a project funded by the EPA. His kids participated in the school lunch program and made it through college courtesy of government-guaranteed student loans. His parents, retired to a farm on their social security, getting electricity from the REA and the soil tested by the USDA. When his father became ill, his life was saved with a drug developed through NIH. The family was saved from financial ruin by Medicare. Then one day, 
he wrote his congressman an angry letter complaining about paying taxes for all those welfare programs created for ungrateful people. Go figure. Jesus says we should give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Whatever the system of government, all citizens receive some things that benefit us in return for what we pay. If Jesus could tell his spiritual community that they had a political duty to pay back a foreign government they had no control over, how much more should we acknowledge our obligations to one another in a system of government that is of the people, by the people, and for the people? But Jesus doesn't end there. He goes on to say that we should give back to God what is God's. So what does he mean by that? What is God's? Isn't it everything? Yes. Which is why we can't limit our Christian stewardship to tithes and offerings that we pay with one hand over here and taxes we pay to the government over here as if, okay, now we're good. That's it. If the first half of Jesus' answer means we should honor the state, the second half of it puts a limit on the state. If Caesar's image is on the coin that we give back to Caesar, where is God's image to be found? stamped on the face of every human being. We are the image bearers of God, which means we are to give back a great deal to our nation. Patriotism, respect, service, and yes, taxes. But we should never conflate faith and flag as if they are one and the same. Our conscience is captive to God and our allegiance to universal human dignity and justice stops at no border. The state does not have ultimate authority. But giving back to God what is God's also isn't about claiming our rights only including our rights, say, to worship wherever we want, whenever we want, without restrictions, even during the COVID-19 period, as if the state, in prohibiting such or limiting us, is trying to persecute the church when it's really trying to protect people. No, the church should be the one that is going to extreme measures to protect every image bearer, and especially those who are most vulnerable. We give back to God what is God's when we advocate for our neighbors, especially those who are being crushed by the systems that always seem to favor those who trade in the coin of the realm rather than those who are always seemingly overwhelmed by the realm because they don't have the coin. This is always then a surprise to people in power. They are used to people advocating for themselves. But when we advocate for others, it's a powerful witness for the powerless to the powerful. My heroes are people whose faith leads them out of their comfort zone to stand with and for people who are being left out. We have numerous CASA volunteers in our church, for example. These are court-appointed special advocates for abused and neglected children who are often moved from one foster house to another in the system. They learn 
these CASA volunteers, about these children's cases, about their lives, about what concerns them. And then they show up in courtrooms and they make sure the kids get the best information and the best treatment and are not re-victimized by systems that they don't understand. This is one way we give back to God what is God's, treating all human beings as precious. Speaking of precious lives, how would you feel if roofing contractors dumped decomposing asphalt shingles in your backyard until they formed a veritable mountain 70,000 unsightly tons of toxic waste piled high in your neighborhood and no one doing anything about it while people in that neighborhood, including children, are left wheezing from the fumes that they are breathing from that stuff. Well, that would never happen, let's be honest, in most of our neighborhoods because of the way systems work. Marsha Jackson and her neighbors in South Dallas also bear the image of God, though. And while the city, the state, the property owner, and the recycling company have just been pointing fingers at each other for nearly three years now, finally, community activists and faith leaders in Dallas have organized and advocated, and it's going to be removed at last. For the love of God, but that's it right there, isn't it? See, the realm of God is based on love, not duty. And because everything belongs to God, then love, more than duty, should rule us in everything, including what we give back to Caesar as well as to God. Amen.